Uh, I, want to I want to clarify the R rating here. Um, what I told Erica was that there's a, a small amount of nudity in the presentation. Um, I, I came down here Sunday afternoon because I really kind of wanted to soak in all of informs and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I really want to thank you for, for, for having me here. The reason why I wanted to make sure that I came down early, not just to meet everybody and sort of understand all the good work that's happening here, but to understand how appropriate some of these slides might be for this audience. And I've come to realize that there may be some inappropriate slides here. But, <laughs> but I think that they're not offensive, so I'm just going to proceed. Um, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll stop and remind you somewhere at the end. Um, I, won't, uh, I won't ask you if you know what eBay is, um, but um, is it eBay fun? Now, many of you may not um, know what eBay is um, because you know what eBay was. If, when you think of eBay, you think of this. Um, that's eBay from 1999. And it doesn't look like that anymore. It looks a lot different. eBay is a lot different. I'll cover a little bit of that and why it matters um, uh, in a few minutes. But I want to point out something here. If you, this is the home page from 1999. If you look at the top right, it says stats. And there's a bunch of numbers up there about how many things we've sold and how many items uh, were for sale, how many people have come and listed. I find it fascinating that back in the early days of the company, it was focused on data. Data was so part of its DNA that it actually made it on the home page. Now, we're a little more sophisticated today. We don't necessarily put our stats on the home page because there's a lot of other things that people are looking for than us talking about our, our own stats. But oh, um, uh, e e eBay is still a fun place. It, is, um, uh, it has evolved. Um, it's not just an auction house uh, that you've known in the past. We actually, more than half of our revenue comes from uh, new, fixed price listings. Um, however, that doesn't mean that you can't still buy an island. And there's an island for sale uh, if you're in sort of five acres. It's not mine. Um, I think off of Nicaragua somewhere. Um, if you need uh, you know, a Star Wars Stormtrooper uh, autographed uh, helmet, it's on eBay, right? Um, and the, I think the thing that's probably the, you know, the answer is off Donald's is the bacon earrings. <laughs> so, yeah, we have a lot of fun at eBay. It's kind of a wacky place, but it's also very serious. There's a lot of data here, um, and there's a lot of change that's happening in the marketplace. So much change, so much rapid evolution, that we really are at an inflection point in the way shopping is happening. And I say we, not just eBay, but all of us in this room all of us outside this room. This inflection point is actually led by consumers. Although technology is, in, is what's enabling it. The, the, the key is mobile, but there's a whole lot that goes beyond this as well. The point is, though, that with all of this innovation and all the changes that are happening, it's a lot of data. Much more than it was before. So, There are four trends we're seeing that are causing this. You've heard, you know, you've heard slow moco, right? The social, local, mobile. Um, and those are four things that we're seeing a lot of, right? Whether it's mobile, right? Where we've all got smartphones, it's much easier to shop online. Um, but not only are you shopping, we're also traveling, right? So we're, we're all over the place. And that matters um, because when we show up at a retailer, maybe we want to be able to do something at the retailer. And so the retailer may want to know that we're there. Or we may want some guidance on our phone or whatever we have once we get to that retailer or the mall or wherever it happens to be. <coughs> Mobile is changing everything. And I want to talk more about that in a minute. Local is actually fascinating. Because back when I started in analytics, it was all what we called website analysis back then. And we thought, Online is everything. Offline is the old way. 
with bricks and mortar. Oh, wow, ah, that's the old stuff. What's amazing now is the confluence. So much of the off, quote, offline, like local stuff that's happening starts online through research, right? Through understanding what products, what might I be interested in, um, looking at comparison shopping, et cetera. A lot of the stuff is online, but moves to offline for purchase. Not all of it, but a lot of it does. And that confluence is very important to understanding how the data flows uh, across them and, and, and beyond them. I don't have to talk much about social, I don't think, right? Um, the advent of flash sites, uh, uh, Groupon, uh, sites like um, Twitter and Facebook, where there's sentiment and there's connections, um, that's just a lot more data that's happening as well, but also changing the way people shop. Uh, and then finally, digital. Now, more and more products that we used to buy in an analog fashion, we now buy digitally. And that, you know, started with books and music and movies and you know, now we have tickets, for example, that are all online, right, that are all digital. More and more of the things that we purchase are, are digital in nature, where there's no actual um, physical good that we're in receipt of, which lends itself really well to online, but also, again, much more data. I mentioned how these worlds are changing, and really it's mobile in the center of these two worlds between online and offline. As we walk around, we really have sort of a shopping mall in our pocket. Now we may not all use all of the features and functionality, but whether it's comparison shopping or finding directions, creating a shopping list to make sure that you have it when you're there, being able to take a photo of something and post it to your Facebook uh, uh, friends to say, what do you think of this? Is this something that you know would look good? Should I buy it or whatever? Um, being able to scan a barcode in the store and get a whole bunch of information about the product right there, or maybe even comparison shop, uh, which are the, you know, the retailers are trying to figure out what do we do about that. Um, being able to pay right from your phone uh, through the mobile commerce. Um, being pushed coupons and uh, various sort of in, um, sort of within a geo area, geo fencing area where you enter into, you're near a Starbucks, for example, and you suddenly get a coupon for a, uh, you know, 10 pesos sound off for a mocha latte or whatever. So there's a lot going on in mobile, and it's all inside the phone. Again, lots more data, and people are mobile. If you're a merchant, you're really not sure how to keep up with this. Because the old way, obviously, was we're going to put up a shingle, we're going to have a bunch of stuff on display, we want to make sure that our merchandising is going well, we want to make sure that we understand the path of the store, we want to make sure the end caps are being stocked appropriately. All the things that they used to worry about, they still worry about. And now, they have all this other stuff to worry about. Like how fast everything is moving. Where do I market anymore? I don't even know. Should I be at Liberty Social? Should I have an Android app? I'm not sure even what I need anymore. It's, and it doesn't matter if you are a sole proprietor or you're a large merchant, you're still going through a lot of this because the pace of innovation is changing. Um, how do I generate demand? Because um, my store is still the same store it ever was, but I need more people to know what I'm doing. This is particularly true in a global market that we live in today that the web and the internet has made available. So you can be a mom and pop creating something unique in your basement and have a worldwide reach and a worldwide audience. How do you do that? How much do you need to invest? How do you deal with shipping? What are all of the logistics that taxes and everything else that happens? Um, and, and so all of this stuff that's happening is really technology driven. Not just mobile, but the, what the internet is making available. And, and the merchants are kind of looking at this going, uh, I need to figure out how to compete in this, in this environment. So the eBay feeling on this is, we used to look at this and say, this is a $400 billion market, right? E-commerce, a couple of years ago. That's a really big number. But that's not what we're seeing in the future. What we're seeing in the future is, it's not e-commerce 
It's just commerce. Because it's all online, offline, it's blurring, it's, it's global, it's local, it's everything. Um, today, we influence a lot, we, internet, right, will influence a lot of the offline world. But this is going to become so integrated very soon. And we're looking at this saying, forget the E, this is just about commerce. And it's, it's frankly a much bigger opportunity. So, so what, what do you think we're doing to help here? Well, you know, the pitch is you want to be able to buy anything, anywhere, anytime. Um, but you want the merchants to be able to make that available, right? And so this environment is very highly complex. Um, and so uh, eBay Inc., right, the large scale eBay that contains marketplaces and PayPal, and GSI, XTOP Commerce, and StubHub, and a number of uh, companies together just want to enable this commerce to make sure that happens in this sort of brain. <coughs> So that's eBay, and kind of the market that we see, not the market, but the, the, what we're seeing uh, as big drivers in the way people are behaving and the changes that technology is driving. I mentioned mobile a little bit, I want to go into a little more detail on mobile. I've seen for a number of years, people would ask the question, do we think that this is the year of mobile? Maybe this is the year. Well. I can show you graphically that it's been the year of mobile for us for a few years now. It's not coming, it's here, but it's been here for a while. In 2011 alone, we did $5 billion in sales, happened, transacted through mobile devices. This is on eBay.com. PayPal, another uh, sister company to eBay uh, marketplaces, did $4 billion in transactions where people paid over the phone or their iPad or whatever it might have been. And you can see from the graph, we're just seeing that climb. It's becoming not only a large growth area for all these companies within eBay, but it also is becoming a larger percentage of the total at eBay. And so it was easy a few years ago to say, let's put a couple of people on mobile because we kind of want to hedge our bets and make sure that we're not kind of lost but a few people said, no, we have to do much more than that because it's going to be the future. And we're seeing double-digit growth. We're seeing double-digit percentages of the site now where it's quite possible that, you know, 2015, these aren't my numbers, my numbers, sorry, but things that I've heard from, from others in the industry that if mobile overtakes PC, if you will, fixed PC um, in a few years, then that's going to make a big difference in how we construct our websites, and how we conduct our marketing programs, and how we reach our customers, how we do fulfillment, customer service, and everything. I hope I've convinced you that there's a lot of mo momentum behind mobile. Mobile also isn't just another mechanism for accessing the same website as before. People act differently when they're using their mobile devices. For example, when they're uh, on their smartphone, they tend to visit more often than we're on their PC. Why? Well, our research has shown, and I think maybe it's common sense might bear this out, is that if you're not in front of your PC, which you are not most of the day, well, I hope anyway, um, you are what our VP of, of mobile calls, information stacking, right? You're going to just always check the phone. I mean, what's happening on Facebook? Right? Something really fast. We all do it. You're standing in line, you're waiting for your gas to, to fill up in your car or whatever it might be, and you're just, oh, I've got a minute to spare, I'll just check. As a result, people come to eBay more often. Right? They're using their phone more often. It also helps that the mobile app will alert you when you've been outbid or when an auction is ending soon or something you've been looking for, something becomes available. That drives more engagement. Yet, the iPad, much richer experience, much larger surface. We're not seeing people aren't pulling out their iPads when they're pumping their gas. But they do use their iPad when they're in front of the TV. Almost everyone does this, right? The TV's on, but you're surfing the web too at the same time. <laughs> Am I wrong? That's important. That's very important. That new use case we didn't see with people 
when they had their, only their PCs or just their laptops. Some, but not anything like we're seeing today. So mobile really is changing the way we behave and the way we interact. And it's a richer experience and you, you can sort of touch it, right? So you're seeing a lot more stuff. We, we, sell, we, sell, we sell airplanes, we sell boats, we sell cars through our, through our mobile apps. It's amazing, but we do it. I'll give you a few examples of mobile here. So um, we have three um, different properties uh, three different companies uh, within within the eBay Inc. family. Um, Red Laser is one. And with the Red Laser app, you can scan barcodes in stores, for example, um, UPC codes or uh, QR codes or whatever it may be. Um, and then you can find with Milo, which is a local search engine, what local merchants, maybe it's your Best Buy or, uh, or, or Kmart or whatever, actually has the items in stock and then we're going to go to get them. Uh, and then pay with PayPal, and then just go pick it up. So here we go. So for example, Toys R Us. Um, you go and just pick it up. And everything has happened online, but you just picked it up at the store. I'll give you another example. You're somewhere, and you see something, and you say, that's cool. I like that. Maybe it's a pattern. Maybe it's uh, someone's blouse. Maybe it's the drapes. Maybe it's the carpet. I don't know. And you say, I want some pants that match that. So you whip out the phone, you take a photo of it, and then you say, okay, here's the sample that I've just captured of this, of this uh, fabric or whatever it is, this watch. Um, now let me discover what you might have uh, on eBay.com that might be for sale that might stoke that desire for me to acquire something that matches whatever it is that I saw. This isn't a possibility, this is what is shipping today in the, in, the, in the iPhone app. It's actually pretty cool. I mentioned that we, we, we sit in front of our TV and we, and we play with the iPad. So we created a Watch with eBay app. And you can tell it what you're watching. And it, through metadata, knows what the items are that might be in the scene, or what the actors are wearing, or the jerseys for the sports team, or anything else that it might be. And you can discover very interesting things. Again, back to sort of stoking that passion about whatever it is that you're involved in at that time. Now, in all honesty, this isn't the most perfect thing only because it doesn't really know about things like DVRs yet. But you can kind of see where this is going, right? Where you want to be, where people are. Okay, so that was all about eBay. I didn't, haven't said anything about analytics yet. I think I should. So, <laughs> lots of volume, high velocity, lots of variety. It smells like big data. I'll talk more about big data in a minute. We saw a lot of stuff. If you want to buy your groceries on eBay, you can do that. We do lots of kinds of analytics. And there's lots of kinds of analytics we do here that's not on here. We're doing inventory forecasting. Inventory, I mean demand forecasting. Demand forecasting. eBay doesn't sell anything. How can, you, how can you demand forecasting? No, we don't sell anything. There's some very interesting aspects of eBay as an ecosystem that lend itself to very fascinating ways in which we want to do analysis. One is, we don't sell anything. We're a marketplace. We just facilitate people connecting, buying demand. And that's our job, is to make that as efficient as possible. The second is, we've got auctions, as well as sort of, you know, fixed price, buy it now kind of stuff. That means, between the time someone came to the site and they transact, it might a leap might go. And you've got to make sure that you tie all that together. The last thing about eBay that's really, well, another thing about eBay that's really interesting and fascinating from an analytics standpoint is no product catalog per se. If, if you want to find um, a, a piece of toast that, with an image like the Virgin Mary burning on it, where would that go in a product catalog if you're going to list that, right? So, it's a very interesting dynamic to try to understand what's being sold on the site. And so we do a lot of text classification, we do a lot of mining, 
um, to try to understand a lot of that stuff. But anyway, the point here is we do lots of different kinds of uh, analytics, and we try to keep it all in one place, and then make that available for everyone to use. Um, that's my job as part of the data platform. So apologies for words, but let me just mention the difference here, the thing that is really important for us, and that is the difference between classic transactional data, the things that you bought, for example, um, and behavioral data, which are the things that you did and up until you bought, or the things that you did that then you did not buy. Um, it's like walking through a grocery store and understanding what aisles are you going up and down, how often do you spend, how much time do you spend in a particular aisle, how do you, which aisles do you go to first and then next, what products are you pulling off the shelf, looking at and then putting back and not purchasing. All that stuff is lost if the only thing that you have to view is the tape at the end of the what you purchased. And for the longest time, we only had the tape. But now we're keeping all the what we call behavioral data, too. What, how do you behave before you get there? I point this out just to be able to show you the distinction here, right? Whether it's I'm going to buy something now, I'm going to list something, I'm going to pay for something. Those are transactions. Versus I'm clicking, I'm taking a path through a site. I have visited, I've spent so much time. Um, these kinds of things. What motivates me? Those are more the behavioral. And so to really kind of understand the complete user experience, we need how did they come to the site, what did they do once they were there, and then for the folks that transacted, um, how to put them all together. Fascinating stuff and a lot of data, a lot of data. In fact, up until a couple of years ago, we weren't keeping a lot of the behavioral data because it was too much and too, too expensive. But prices have come down significantly on the ability to store and process and take advantage of that. I run a team that is in charge of the analytical infrastructure, the engineering organization uh, for the company. What we've discovered is about 85% of the workload that we do is ad hoc. It's new, it's unknown, it's not production kind of stuff. So for the 15% that are known and in sort of production, we do our best to make them as cheap and as efficient as possible. The things that we don't know generally can be pretty expensive. Sometimes we'll see these long table scans and we'll say, what are you doing? And we'll understand that there's some very interesting set of machine learning happening or whatever it might be. The intent is you've got to come up with these hunches. You then go back and say, I found a correlation. Now let me go validate that to see if it's the correlation and causation. right?" are there, so we'll start to do some exploration and some testing as a, as a part of that. And that's what's going to drive innovation. So we have to design that. However, we also have to run the site 24-7. So we've got you know dual active everything, so there's failover. Um, we're, we're turning over about 80 petabytes a day, which sounds like a lot, because it's a lot. But that doesn't mean that we're getting 80 petabytes a day in. What it means is, we're getting about 50, maybe 60 terabytes a day to come in, sort of raw data. And then we're turning it over by aggregating it and sampling it and doing all the fun things that we do with it to make it easy to digest for analysts and for our uh, product managers, our executives, our developers, and so our data scientists. So this is a slide that I showed a couple of years ago at a conference that I talked about our systems and how we have these, I don't think I said big data then, um, but we have this big data, and we've got, we had just put in our grid, our Hadoop cluster of five petabytes, um, and our uh, semi-structured six petabyte system. Um, and so the 2009 version of this was looked even more different. Um, keep the numbers in mind, and I'll show you what it will look like at the end of 2012, third quarter of 2012, when we finish our latest round of build-outs. We've, we've moved, we've, we've tripled in size uh, on the relational, uh, the semi-structured. Uh, there's some amazing stories about um, this one system, the semi-structured system has 18,000 two terabyte disk drives on it. It took seven semis to deliver the system. Um, and then we're building uh, much larger Hadoop grids. And so you see that there's two of them, there's these big 24 petabyte systems. And, and I, don't, I don't 
I'm not here to show you all the numbers to say, look how awesome we are. Um, it's really to say, this allows us to do interesting things that we couldn't do with a small amount of data, but it also creates its own weather, its own sort of infrastructure of all the stuff you got to do to make sure that um, what you thought you could do at us, I'm not going to say small data, but sort of regular stuff, at a, at a scale so far above where you kind of understand the parameters, you have to think differently. Um, uh, a lot of people have asked me in the last couple of days, so how does how does the analytics team organize? So I thought I'd just sort of show you. So it's kind of a dual hub and spoke, if you will. The CFO likes to say, we like to separate church and state. So I report to the CTO. I'm part of the engineering organization. And my team on the sort of right hub is the analytics platform team. We build the infrastructure that allows all of the other teams, like the merchandise team, or the search engine marketing team, or the trust and safety team, to build models, to build products that do prediction and churn, whatever it might be, on top of the platform that we provide. And then there's kind of a parallel organization of analysts that roll up to the CFO. Um, and so they're defining the metrics, we produce them. All right, so I just want to warn you right now about some things that may not be appropriate. Why am I showing you this? I don't mean the warning, but what I'm about to show you. It's because I find that we tend to live kind of way up here in the abstract. We think about turn models and we think about all this really highfalutin stuff. But you know what it, what it really happens, where all of it's really happening? It's really happening here on the bare floor. <laughs> and this to me, yeah, okay, thank you for the groans. And so this to me represents so much potential, right? Because here's where it all happens. This is where the processing happens. This is where the data comes in. This is where the models are being run. And my job is to fill these, right? I hate to fill them up and then run them, of course. So I'll show you some examples. So these are naked disk drives. <laughs> and so there's here, there's, this is our initial Hadoop nodes. There's, there's, Ten one terabyte drives in each uh, in each uh, node, if you will, um, and a little SSD drive at the top right. These ten one terabyte drives are used for data for holding our data, and then we'll take lots and lots and lots of these and we'll stick them all on these big drives. We went to the manufacturer when they showed us these, and we said, "There's, there's two extra slots down there. Can we put two more disks in there?" And they said, yeah, you know, no, because we didn't size the power supply and the fan. And the, we didn't really size it for that. So, no. All right. So in the next uh, round of these, we changed them. <laughs> so now our new systems have, have 12 2 terabyte drives instead of these systems. Anyway, so some data porn for you. But then we take these and we stick them in racks. These are nice racks here. <laughs> this, is our, this is our first Hadoop cluster. There's 500 and something nodes here. Each one of these is what the tray I just showed you, all kind of stacked and racked and made to rock. We did so much with this, and it returned on its investment so fast that the CFO said, uh, you want a whole lot of money, and I could probably buy a company for what you're asking, but I'm seeing the return that you're providing, so sure, you can, you can build out some more. So we, we're, this is our second version of it. Um, the racks are wider, the racks are taller. We wanted them taller, but they can't be too tall unless you make them wider. But we made them white. I was talking to Thornton May last night at dinner, and he said to me, what do you think big data is? And I said, I think big data is white racks. Well, he scribbled it down, but I'm not sure if he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to tell you. Actually, I told him. We have so many racks that we went to the manufacturers and said, we want these painted white. And the reason we want them painted white is because they will better reflect light. 
which means we don't have to have as many lights on in the data center, which means less cooling, which means less power, which means we have to pay less. And if you're thinking about you have one or two racks, you're not thinking this way. But when you have the kind of scale that big data really is, you have to think this way. So anyway, just kind of a crazy. Oh, one other thing I'll talk about then here, and that is you'll notice that this is not a raised floor. These racks, fully populated, are about a ton and a half each. So um, they would go right through the raised floor. So we, we, we put them on concrete. OK, last one. Uh, I swear, I will be done. So I showed you the Hadoop cluster. Those are the, the white racks. We have so much data that you can't just sort of send them over the network. right? So we rolled these in. We built them. We rolled them in right next to the existing Hadoop cluster. And then we pushed the data to it really fast. right? because it's really close to it. And then we took the data, we put them on a truck, we put all the machines on a truck, and then we trucked all the data to the other <coughs> data center. So there is no better bandwidth than a truck full of <laughs> Now, granted, the latency is terrible. Right? <laughs> So I'll just point out that these are furniture moving uh, blankets. And the one in the back is topless. OK. So all right, let's go back to reality. So there's a bunch of things that we're either doing or seeing that are impacting our future. And I believe they will impact your future as well. So I just want to talk about them really quick. I mentioned this before, right, in that, in that we can't just do what we were doing before and think we're going to succeed. Um, we have to do something different because the challenges are different. So I'm going to talk about four things that I see as coming or are already here that will impact us all. The first is it's going to happen in parallel. And what I mean by that is it used to be in the old days you'd have a ton of data and you need to process it. So you move it to your, your big workstation or your PC or whatever, and you chew on it for a while, and you get an answer, and you say, I have an answer. Too much data now. Too much data. You do not want to move data, if at all possible. It's much cheaper to buy a whole lot of processing and put them close to the data, and then know which processing and which data kind of are co-located to each other so that you can distribute the load to the processors closest to the data, so you don't have to move the data. This is the foundation for the software known as Hadoop. This is how it does this. And, and, and I say it's the future, right? But the reality is Intel stopped making unit processors six years ago. Right? They've always had, since then, no dual core and uh, hyper-threading and everything else. But the reality is, it is the hardest problem in computer science of doing it right. Making sure it's consistent and, and everything else. So a lot of energy is going right now to the communities <coughs> trying to figure this out. How do we do this at, at very large scale? The second is that machines will learn. There is just too much data for a human to be able to understand all the ramifications of things. Now, that's been true for a long time. But machine learning is going to be just the way we think about how to make things happen. This graphically shows, this is actually, this, I pulled this from some research that uh, was done at Microsoft Research a number of years ago. And what they did was, they had five algorithms that were trying to be as accurate as possible. So they're going to be able to go from zero to one. And they all start out on the left-hand side, and they score these algorithms. In the old way of doing things, they would say, well, these five algorithms have five different scores. But we're not satisfied with any of them. Maybe we'll put the best one into production. But now we want to actually create even better ones. Well, how do we do that? Well, we get a bunch of really smart people in a room, and they think about what are the better algorithms to produce. That will always be another avenue. But if you teach the machines, if you give them more input data, let them learn. And so the machines here are learning, and these algorithms, as you give it more data, and you see this kind of a exponential logarithmic scale here, 
you're seeing that all of these algorithms are getting smarter. Now, I'm not saying don't use the scientists, right, or the researchers. I'm saying now you can combine them with all this machine learning capability and the machines and the models that the machines have can start to learn and get better as they have more data. What this means is the more data you have, the smarter your algorithms are going to be. The third, there just is no one solution when it comes to this stuff. And so if you, if you think about how you want to build a system and you want to build a sort of a, a system that holds a lot of data and processes a lot of data, if you want to optimize for, say, concurrency in I.O. and governance, um, you're going to go with a, a classic EDW. This is actually one of the things that we did was this is our Teradata system, on, which is A, it's sort of blue here. But if what you really need is a lot of flexibility and really high CPU uh, usage, you kind of have a different profile. And that's, it, in, in our case, it's Hadoop is the one that's in green. And you can see by these profiles that they don't overlap. So an EDW and a Hadoop system are not going to displace each other in all cases. So I just want to point out that. So what does that mean for eBay? We have three data platforms. We have our, our classic EDW. We've got a thousand concurrent users, very big on concurrency. We have kind of this middle system, which we use for sort of semi-structured data we call singularity. And um, it's used by researchers and analysts, but both are used for reporting and analyzing. It's just that EDW tends to be thousands and thousands. We do a couple million queries a day on EDW. Singularity might be hundreds of very long-running queries for lots of lots of data. This is our 36 uh, petabyte system here. And then we have our Hadoop system, um, where we're going to do our sort of discovery and exploration. And those generally are for programmers and scientists, and you know, sort of R&D. And we put everything in that. So we put our images in there. We put uh, all of the transactions, all the behaviors, everything that's in EDW and Singularity also goes into it. Because um, you just kind of never know. And then we're building these fat pipes between them so that we can um, quickly have, say, in Hadoop, you're running a program and it calls a SQL call out to, say, Singularity and gets a result and it continues to process, or vice versa. And so we're trying to sort of have our cake eat it too. And then the last thing um, is that it will be collaborative. Now, I, we've been working on a product that internally we call Data Hub. And we've, it's, it's available now to, uh, to our internal uh, community of data users. And it's fundamentally three things. It is a one-stop shop for all of data. So I now no, no longer have to figure out, OK, where is the relationship management dashboard? And where is the search dashboard? And where is the, right, is all you've got this large, and eBay is a large enterprise with lots and lots of groups building all kinds of really interesting things. How do I know which URLs to go? I've got a bookmark list a mile, a mile long. Data Hub becomes the central place where you go to find whatever you need that's data related. So invest a lot in search engines and you know, all that. The second thing about Data Hub is it's essentially a, think of it kind of like a social network for analysis. The intent here is you've got people who you might follow or discover who are doing things similar to things that you need to do, maybe in different areas. You can form groups, you can form, actually I'll show you a few screen snapshots. These are some groups around, I know you can't read these, um, around say uh, open source or around Teradata or around Tableau or anything that someone might just decide they want to create a group around and then a discussion forums, etc. cetera. Uh, everything is kind of live and interactive. Um, here I have a, uh, researcher on my team and his job is to mine our internal data for things like parallel efficiency of our systems. And so he can put together this graph um, and then on the right hand side had all kinds of information about it. This is all one click publishing by the way. Um, we augmented Tableau with a little button down at the bottom to say publish the data hub. Uh, and there it goes and you can just type it in. What you can't see because I didn't capture enough of it is underneath there can be a discussion about the research that he's done. And again, this is not all in uh, email somewhere, in a discussion list or somewhere that no one knows about. 
Um, this is all right here, easily discoverable in the data hub. Uh, and then the, I said there's three things. So the third thing is really it's a publishing platform for new kinds of tools. Um, and so if you want to, say, have a um, uh, experimental sandbox, if you're an analyst and you want to say, can I have like 100 terabytes that I can sort of play with? Um, but I don't want to have to build my own, uh, buy my own system, and put it under my desk and all that. Um, you can go to a tool here and you have what we call virtual data marts. In five minutes, um, you say, this is what I want, this is how much I want it for, whether it has publicly, uh, sorry, personally identifiable information or not, special handling for that. And then bam, you have your data mart. And it already has, because it's inside the warehouse, it already has connections to the listings table, the transaction table, the customer table, so you don't have to copy any of that stuff. And it all gets backed up and everything else. We don't have data marts at, at eBay. We have virtual data marts in the warehouse. That's it. So, uh, I'm available for any questions.